What happens when two parent coaches, one a Christian and the other an agnostic Jew, sit down to talk about parenting? They take their listeners from surviving to thriving. I'm Dina Thayer. And I'm Kira Dorian. Welcome to Raising Adults, a podcast brought to you by Future Focused Parenting. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Raising Adults. Kira and Dina still recording not together, but together at least with our voices today. And I know we have a a little bit of a unique situation. So Kira, why don't you explain what our listeners might notice? So we had an interesting week this past week in our house. The kids were on spring break. Dave had the week off. I minimized my work as best as I could last week. And it was very eye-opening to me that the the way that we were trying to run the house was not working um, at all. So one of the things I realized that was making things really challenging is trying to keep my family quiet while Dina and I recorded um, because I have two eight-year-olds and a husband who's trying to also work and have meetings and a father, you know, who needs to like prep his lunch and uh, all these things. And so trying to silence my household for 45 minutes was really, really challenging. And so it was just causing so much tension in the house for them to have to be so quiet. So I talked to Dina, and as always, she was amazing. And we just decided, you know what? It's okay for you guys to hear my house. Like, I have kids who are making noise and a husband who's at work and a very, very quality microphone (laughs) that is possibly going to pick up all of that. So we just wanted you to know, and we will be kind of making a shorter version of this announcement every episode so that if anybody's brand new to the laundry room, or I guess we should start calling it like the bonus laundry room, Dina. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that that could work. There we go. If you're new to the bonus laundry room, um, that people will understand why they might be hearing that noise because we realized that, you know, some people might listen to these episodes years after coronavirus has gone bye-bye. So we just wanted to put that out there. So you just may hear my littles. You might hear them. You might hear my husband on the phone. It'll be soft and subtle. Um, but I've just kind of always had a a personal thing about when I listen to a podcast and I can hear household noise or they don't cut a sneeze or they're talking to their cat like that just drives me bonkers on podcasts um and so we've Dina and I have been very sensitive to not wanting to create that environment but we just realized that like the mental health of my family is is more important right now so we're making that small change so just FYI listeners yes these are not normal times so the things that we would normally strive for one of which is super great sound quality might just not be there. And I don't have the incredible microphone that's in the laundry room. So my household is going about life around me, but you probably won't hear it. (laughs) So I guess there's maybe, maybe that small positive, but yeah, it's important to know this just looks different. And if you're new to raising adults and you're excited to hear great sound quality, we're excited to bring it back to you again, as soon as we can. So (laughs) one day we're doing our best quality again. Today is not that day. (laughs) (laughs) So the good news, after the maybe not great news of sound quality, the good news is Kira and I are finally talking about a topic we have tossed around literally for over an entire calendar year because we both were excited to talk about it, but then other things would come up or we would get a listener question that really drove a topic choice or just life happened and it really kind of Allow, and we love that, that we can allow the podcast to be somewhat dictated by, you know, what, what happens in the real world and what comes up for us as parents and what you all are wondering about. But we finally get to talk about this today. So I'm looking forward to it. And what we're going to talk about is happiness. And for Kira, it's actually really part and parcel of your overarching why. And I know you'll get to talk about that in a second. And for me, it's not even really something I'm aiming at when I parent. So I think this will be interesting, although I secretly suspect that a lot of how we approach this will be very similar and that may be more of a semantics difference. But still, nonetheless, I'm looking forward to finally getting to tackle happiness. It's you know, been a while. I feel like we're like grasping at straws for differences now. It's like, ooh, maybe we'll we'll find a way to be different on this one. <laughs> it's so funny, um, especially given like you know, ours, fundamentally, we are so different. And we're very similar in personality type, I think. But, um, you know, view of the world is is quite different. And more often than not, <laughs> we agree. It's wild. It's absolutely wild. I think that's so fascinating how 
two people can approach the world so differently, but then in how that manifests in their actual life mm-hmm. can look so similar. And mm-hmm. I think we're just a testament of that, but also how great, because all of you out there have friends, neighbors, family members who probably think quite differently than you. And I think Kira and I are proof that there's probably some common ground in there somewhere. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Which can so. be great. And we we are the other fun, I and mean, this is a way we actually are different, is that Kira is more digital than I am. And so when we talk about different podcast ideas, she's like jotting them down in her notes app and I'm literally writing things down. (laughs) So before we got on to record today, I've told her how excited I am because I've been carrying around this index card with the things I want to say about happiness for like a year and a half. (laughs) The thing is like tattered and flimsy. It's not even cardstock anymore. So I'm pretty excited that I'll get to recycle. I was just going to say, you must be (laughs) stoked that you get to throw that away because I know you don't like excess stuff. So that's awesome. I am not a hanger on her, that's for sure, like the opposite of a hoarder. So today, we are not necessarily starting with our why. We're going to just make sure that we're speaking the same language first and do a little bit of definition, explaining either why we were aiming toward this and what we think it means or why we weren't, because as we've shared, we're working to make meaning together. And and that happens between Kira and I, but also between Kira and I and you, our listeners. So that's a really important piece. So I'll tell you my initial thoughts on this. And and I think it will just lead, hopefully lend itself into a conversation. And, And Kira, I still suspect we might not be as far off as I thought we might be. Mm -hmm. So, so essentially for me, happiness is It's this emotional, like, I feel good, something great happened. And I I think of it in two ways. Number one, that it's circumstantial. And number two, that it's fleeting. So the reason, and this is partly getting at my why, or maybe my not why, why I didn't aim for this, and why I aim for healthy, not happy. Happiness is not a goal of parenting for me, because I don't see it as sustainable. I think happiness comes dependent on circumstance and then it can leave just as easily when circumstances are challenging or frustrating. And so I I didn't love it for those two reasons. One it's feelings based and I I'm not really big on trusting my uh, trusting feelings. I'm more rational decision maker. I think feelings are really important. I don't know that I trust them in terms of decision making and all of that as much. And I don't put a lot of weight in things that aren't lasting. I really look at, hey, is this temporal or is it something that we can cultivate that would be lasting? So I was aiming at those different things that aren't, that are independent of circumstance and are sustainable, which would be the opposite of happiness, which to me seems dependent on circumstance and not sustainable. So that's my little, just little jumping off point. That's so interesting because I think, I think we got two things going on. I think that there's a little bit of a vocabulary issue where maybe we agree more than we think. But then I think there's actually like a fundamental difference here. So that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. Okay. So for me, happiness is about um, experiencing, I guess contentment is maybe the better word. But like the the feeling of I'm, I've, I'm happy with my life. I'm content. I have enough. I'm grateful for what I have. Um, I'm not constantly seeking more. I don't pay more attention to the negative than the positive. And I think that it comes from a friend of mine in college. um, I remember we had a huge debate because he was like, you realize that emotions are a choice, right? Like you can choose to be happy. And I was like, that's ridiculous. What do I can't help my feelings. And like we had this massive, (laughs) massive debate. But as I grew into adulthood and I kind of discovered it sounds so cheesy. I hate even having these words come out of my mouth. But like I discovered living a life of gratitude. Um, I I really did realize that I, I actually can affect my feelings simply by shifting out of looking at what I lack and shifting into looking at what I have. It doesn't mitigate all my feelings and it doesn't mean that I'm ignoring the stuff that's hard. But I have found that that grateful living really does just bring up a joyful feeling in my heart and helps me move through the hard stuff more easily. And so I think that's what I mean by happiness is I I guess I guess I almost define happiness by the opposite 
of the way that most people, I think, live their lives, which is they just notice the bad. They move mm-hmm. through their lives like noticing what they don't have or the hard things that happen to them. And the moments that are beautiful pass them by and they're not actually stopping to notice them. So to me, that's living in happiness doesn't mean you're happy all the time because I agree with you. I think emotions are fleeting, but I think we have a lot more control over them than we think. And I also think that we could live in happiness a lot more if we took the time to notice when we were happy. But I guess this is okay. I'm actually going to make a point now, I swear. Um, And that is that (laughs) I think that most people don't notice when they're happy. And that's what I wanted for my kids. I wanted them to notice it, to, to not have it pass them by, to go, I'm out in the sunshine and I feel a happy heart. I'm happy right now. And to not miss that because they don't yet have the job they want or enough money in the bank or, or whatever, that their happiness is not dependent on these other things because they're not noticing all the things that bring them that joyful feeling all day, every day. Yes. Does that and, make and sense? There's... Yes, it does, because I actually had things on my note card about contentment. So I'm glad you brought that up, because I think this phrase, similar to raising children, a phrase I don't love is the pursuit of happiness. I think Mm. sometimes when we're always trying to be happy, we actually miss it. Um, There's that Edith Wharton quote that's like, if only we'd stop trying to be happy, we could have a pretty good time. And I think there's some, some truth to that. Like people are running around chasing it all the time and then miss it for the fact that they're chasing it. Or uh, a a great example of this is NYU, one of the most popular classes on campus is the science of happiness. And so I think people are always wanting to know, like, what's the secret? (laughs) And the secret is that there's not a secret. (laughs) Like, there's, there's so much about being content with what you have, living and not and not snubbing that there's another quote, I'll I'll look it up so I can give the guy proper credit. But um, about snubbing contentment as we look for happiness. Let me look here because i it's a good one. Oh, Doug Larson. The world is full of people looking for spectacular happiness while they snub contentment. So I'm actually really glad you brought that to bear because that's an important piece of this for me is that instead of this craving or this pursuit, that's the word we use a lot, the pursuit of happiness, I can actually enjoy what I do have. And I think that breeds the more long-term version of happiness that is independent of circumstance and is sustainable, which to me, I would call joy. So this is this is the key for me. So once again, I'm like, Kira, you said it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, it's funny because I, I I don't know that I don't know that it's contentment in my in my heart when I when I'm noticing those small things. It is happiness mm-hmm. or joy, which I guess is what you're saying is that one can be joyful. I don't know. It's a bizarre word combo pack of like happiness, joy, like what's the difference between the two? But I do think we're saying the same thing. The one thing I would say that stuck out that I'm not and I think this is just a personality thing, but I do I do think like feelings can be leaders in our lives and oftentimes trusting our feelings and trusting our instincts and and all of that will actually help us make the better decision, even if it's not the most logical or rational decision, like letting our hearts lead the way and letting our emotions lead is something I do. And so that doesn't for me, that's not something that mm-hmm. I want to steer my kids a- away from. But I can understand how you know, that's a personality thing that's different. Um, But yeah, so I guess we're saying the same thing, that like, we don't want to be seeking out happiness out there and not paying attention to the joy or contentment or, you know, whatever word we want to use for it right now. Like conceptually, you and I are saying the same thing. Yes, I think that's exactly it. And probably the only key difference is that feelings being a leader versus the more rational side. And I do, I think that's a personality thing. And I think probably you out there listening as parents, you'll know where you kind of fall on that. And I do think there's got to be a balance because we can't so follow our hearts that we don't bring our reason right. with us. And you can't be so analytical and rational that you that you start to ignore your gut because that can really be dangerous too. I've gotten myself into yucky situations because I wanted to push down a gut feeling. And so I think there has to be some balance, but I think it's quite normal for people to lean more toward one than the other. And so you out there who are parents just know that's very normal. People fall all across that continuum from rational being a super thinker to being a super feeler. But I would just encourage you to make sure the other one's at least along for the ride, right? (laughs) Because they are important and they work in tandem quite beautifully. (laughs) 
Yeah. So I guess, okay, so can we pick a word? Because I think we're agreeing. (laughs) So, I mean, I'm fine with joy. Does joy work for you? Totally fine. So let's call it joy. So how, you know, if you're leaning away from pursuing this idea of like happiness, which I, I understand what you're saying there, how did you teach your children to cultivate joy? Yeah, that's it. It was a, it's a tall order and it is a work in progress. Let's say that. Um, so a couple of things, one, and, and I, I have to say one of my children has taken to this and one has not, but one is about something you mentioned at the top of the episode. And that is gratitude, paying, paying attention to what's great, I think really helps. And it also helps us when I'm thinking of joy as kind of this underlying foundation. I just want to give everyone the mental picture that I have. And then these little bumps as the happiness. So there's like little peaks and then there's little valleys and that's going to happen throughout life. And what I wanted to set my children up for was this undercurrent and foundation of I'm still okay, even when I'm in the valley up above. So I think looking for what you said about noticing is really important. I have one child who actually does like a gratitude journal and really latched onto that and found it helpful. One who that's just not going to be their jam and that's okay. But I do think paying attention to what's still okay, even if you're in a happiness dip, you can still be in a solid joy foundation. And I think that was a big thing for me. So that, for instance, even when something challenging is happening, like when my daughter was waitlisted from a college she was really interested in going to, she did a great job of, and again, this is something we'd walked together through for years. So she had practice. We talk all the time about just kind of flexing those muscles. You have to practice, but she totally felt the ouchie of that because it feels like a rejection and our our kids are going to experience that at different points in their life. But then what I loved is then she was able to move through and find out what was good. And I think I can't get away today from having my faith paradigm play in because it definitely does. And I think there was also this element for her of being able to say, well, this must not be part of God's plan for me right now. And to be able to say that, and also to say, look at these other great places that did accept me to be able to find some good. And so I think the gratitude piece can't really be overstated because it's also what enables us to move through an ouch. If we're, if we're just living for the circumstantial yay, then when the ouch comes, we aren't really coping with it. Mm -hmm. So I think, so I think gratitude is one piece of it, but another piece for me is about community. And what I mean by that is making sure there are people and support systems and communication in place to literally practice working through both the good and the hard that comes in our life. Because the other thing that I have found is the ability to be kind of mentally healthy when happiness subsides or when you're not on one of those peaks is pretty directly proportionate to how how much we're doing that in isolation. And so from an early age, of course, at first, just like we are children's first teachers, we're probably their first little community too. So this is parents, obviously, very early on, but then we want to work to make sure there's other adults, mentors, coaches, people in their lives, and then eventually they're also going to hopefully have a really strong and positive peer group to talk through things with so that there's a way to process when we don't have a way to process the hard. Mm -hmm. I think it's so much more difficult to maintain any kind of contentment or joy or whatever you want to call that underneath foundational part. Instead, you're just riding all these highs and lows kind of by yourself and going, what do I do? And now not only are you in a hard, you're thinking I must be the only one feeling this way, Mm -hmm. which makes it 10 times worse. And now I've talked a long time, but those are just two (laughs) things right away. I think gratitude and and having community to process things can help us find find that joy again, even if the happiness took a dip, if that makes sense. (laughs) Yeah. No, I love that. Especially that community piece. I hadn't really thought about it in that way. And I I like that. I need to chew on that, but I I really like that. Um, What about you? Well, you know, two things I think come to mind in in how we do this with our kids. And, and, And I will say that and I think I, I'm, I'm sure Dave will be okay with me sharing this. And I can't remember if I've already shared this on the show or not, but I don't think I have. Um, we were in the car like, I don't know, six months ago, nine months ago. And the concept of the glass half full, half empty came up. Mm. And um, and I, my husband 
said, well, you know, I think I'm just a glass half empty kind of guy. And I was like, oh. And, and he said, why? What are you? And I was like, well, I'm a glass half full kind of gal. And then we asked our kids and they actually responded. One was half full and one was half empty. And it was interesting because I suddenly saw that child and my husband through a different lens. Like, mm. oh, you're just kind of like wired that way to see the half empty. And I struggle with that as a half full kind of gal <laughs> because it's like <laughs> there's so much water in the glass. Like, <laughs> guys, look, <laughs> look at all the water in the glass. Um, so, I mean, that was kind of it was like a real epiphany for me around him and around my kids and 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 just especially with that one child, like how important this life lesson is going to be <laughs> about like, can we shift our focus to the water that's in the glass? Um, but I think there were there were two two different ways that that we've gone about this or that I've gone about this, because this is something that's particularly important to me. So one is, and I know I've shared this on the show before, but it, it bears sharing again, um, the glass jar exercise. So I go into my kids' class every single year. Um, I don't think I'm going to get to this year, which is sad, but every year I've gone in with a glass jar and a bunch of puff balls. And I tell this story about a little girl named Sarah, and I kind of go through Sarah's day. And I have blue puff balls and I have yellow puff balls. And the first time I tell the story, and I'm talking about her day. It's the same story every time I tell it, but I only put yellow puff balls in the jar. And the yellow puff balls happen every time something bad happens in her day. And so at the end of the story, I hold up the jar and it's filled with all these yellow puff balls. And I say, what color is the jar? And the kids say, yellow. And some of the kids who are glass half full kids raise their hands and say, but you didn't put puff balls in for any of the happy stuff. I said, oh, that's so interesting. Let's try it again. And I tell this exact same story again. But this time I put in the yellow puff balls when something bad happens. And I put the blue puff balls in when something happy happens or something, you know, that would that would warm her heart, make her feel good. And these are little examples. Her friend asks her to play at recess. Um, mom packed her favorite lunch. She did well on her test. You know, not not those massive things like you're talking about, the the the, the little mm -hmm. things, right, that that add up in our lives. And then I hold up the jar and I say, what color is the jar? And they say, well, it's blue and it's yellow. I say, yes. And that, my friends, is the key to happiness. You have to have both in the jar because if you don't put the blue puff balls in, all you're ever going to see is a yellow jar. But if you put the blue in, it doesn't make it less yellow. The yellow is still there. But look, the yellow is surrounded by the blue puff balls. And so I explained to them, and as I have with my kids, the secret is to know how to hold both of those things and to not be surprised by either one. Your life is going to have joy and your life is going to have hardship. You can't get through life without those things. And so learning how to not be surprised when things are hard and how to also not be surprised when things are good, and how to let both of those things be in the jar, that's how we live a joyful life. So that exercise has been something that I do with the kids, and then of course I'm in their classroom doing it, and that's the message that we send all the time. We're not trying to get those yellow ones out of the jar, because I think, and we talked about this on the gratitude episode, people think that living joyfully means that you're ignoring all the bad stuff, and that's not it. It's allowing the bad stuff to be there, but not making it that you don't also notice what's good. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing I think really comes back to that normalizing that you and I are so passionate about, Dina. Like the more that we say, actually, this hard <laughs> thing that you're going through is really normal, the easier it is to feel good about your life. Because it's not like, oh, my gosh, no one else in the world has ever had this hardship happen to them. It's like, no, actually, this is kind of normal and it stinks and we have to ride it out. You know, like your daughter, right? Like no one's mm -hmm. ever been, I'm the only person who's ever been waitlisted. That's not what she said, <laughs> right? She <laughs> right. was able to recognize that like this is hard, but I've got other blue puffballs in here to lessen the blow, right? Yeah. And I, so I think for us, it's been those two things. Those have been really huge. But the, the key here, FFPs, is that you're not dismissing the hard. We have to be okay with the hard. The hard doesn't make your life not joyful. The hard is just a part of really what can still be a joyful life if you notice and you let it. Does that make sense? Of course. And I actually think without the hard, it doesn't highlight 
right. the, the good stuff as, as starkly. I think we actually can come to appreciate the good so much more after coming through some hard stuff. And it's kind of like after you've been sick, you have that extra appreciation for feeling healthy. Yes. Like my and, throat feels so normal. I love yes. it. <laughs> oh, I can swallow. You know, it's just, it's so true. And so without if we just dismiss the 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 difficulty and go all Pollyanna, I don't think that's a fair representation either. Right. And and we can do a disservice. And what's so interesting, I love that you brought up the normalizing because I think that's essentially the function that a community can serve. And so helping your children work toward as they become young adults to have a good community around them, those are those are then the people when it's not you anymore. Those are the people going, oh yes, that happened to me too. That stunk when I got waitlisted. And yeah, they're able to normalize and and hear that from people who care about them, but that also can help them move through. And I and I have to comment on your glass half empty thing, because that also is such an important piece of this conversation. And that is because as a glass half empty person myself, and, and probably people who are glass half empty will resonate with this. When people tell us we're pessimists, we're like, no, we're realists. <laughs> we get real <laughs> feisty about that because it's it's not that we're just, oh, negative Nelly, everything's the worst. It's actually, for a lot of us, the way we maintain joy. And let me unpack that. So what I mean by that is then if the worst happens or the thing that I've hedged my bets against occurs, I am not bummed and surprised. Yeah. This this is what helps us set our expectations. People who lean more positive are already going to be like, mm, that makes sense. You know, things are hard. If you're a glass half empty person and you haven't done that work to prep yourself, then you're not only experiencing the hard, you're also like, what? I wasn't expecting this. And that's <laughs> even worse. Yeah. And so when we can at least say, yeah, that makes sense. I kind of thought it might go that way. For us, that helps us move through it in a healthy way. So please know here again, FFPs, that if you're on one end or the other of that spectrum, also congratulations, you're totally normal. Everyone is going to be wired differently. We have to bring our different strengths to the table. If the world was all glass half empties, it'd be really rough, but guess what? It would if it was all glass half full people as well. Mm -hmm. We really need each other because we bring different strikes. And while, while we all have our different little defense mechanisms that we use to cope, being able to cope is actually overall, we need to view that as positive. If you bring coping strategies into your life, that's great. Just because you don't choose the same coping strategy as, as, as I do, doesn't mean you're not being successful at this. You're absolutely succeeding. Well, and here's, here's the thing though. And I mean, not all our listeners would know this about you. So I want to make sure that they do. And that is that whilst I completely can see how you're a glass half empty person, you constantly fill those blue puff balls, like fill your jar with those blue puff balls. So you're someone who is doing the work that's necessary to find that balance. And I think that's where it gets dangerous is we can't let our kids, our kids are who they are. Like that revelation of like, I have a kid who's glass half empty. It was like, oh, that actually makes a ton of sense. And so I actually have different responsibilities with each of my kids. So for my kiddo who's glass half empty, my job is actually to teach this child how to put the blue puff balls in, how to recognize the happy, how to stop and notice like, hey, this moment's beautiful. Let's lean into that so that we have that to hold on to when there's a hard moment. But for my glass half full kid, I actually have to do the opposite. I have to commend them for noticing all the beautiful stuff. But then I also have to lean in and say, you got to notice the hard. Don't dismiss your hard. You have to process that. It's okay to have things feel hard. And it's okay to lean into that too. And I think that's the key as parents is like figuring out th there are different roles for different kids, which is all of parenting, right? But in this particular topic, very, very different what you need to be cultivating for each child if you have kids that are wired differently. That's, I mean, spot on. Absolutely. And, and the things that you might need to point out or help them highlight are going to look different because it could be easy to almost want to sweep the hard stuff under the rug if you're a naturally positive bent or to go dark and morbid if you're naturally not. And that's the thing too, is there's a, there's an element of not getting complacent. Mm -hmm. And so I think while you as parents and as you encourage your children to understand how they're wired, there's beauty in that. But we also, I would say, 
this is another reason that I work on this with, with my children is we also don't want to let our wiring become our excuse for complacency. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just how I am. And because there's room for growth people. And, th and this is, this is an area of that, especially for people who maybe do tend toward a little bit more negative outlook. There's room for growth. Let's find that joy. Or maybe there's room for growth for that really positive child that just wants to not even talk about it when something's challenging. And so to not let the wiring become an excuse is also something to watch for, especially as they get older, because I think then they're able to articulate, well, that's just the way I am. So kind of too bad, so sad. Right. And, and we really watched for that in our home and didn't allow that as a cop out. And, and just like you said about me, you know me quite well. And while I tend this way, maybe a glass half empty person, I look for the ways to challenge myself and to grow and to say, all right, where's the good? And it still helps me prepare if it doesn't go that way. So for me, that's that's a safer option. It's more comfortable, but I don't want to get so comfortable. I'm resting on my laurels and then making excuses to not grow and change in a positive way. We want to continue moving forward. We're dynamic as people. We're not static. Well, and I think the other key piece, which you brought up and is a hundred percent accurate is that element of surprise. So half empty glassers, <laughs> that's what I'm calling <laughs> you now, half empty glassers, they protect themselves with the kind of realism and the possible negative outcomes to prevent surprise. And I think glass half fullers need to also be recognizing that then when hard happens, it can't be surprising to them. And that's where we fall down, right? Is that if you're a glass half full person and you're dismissing hard, like, oh, hard doesn't happen. Hard's not going to happen. I'm not, you know, blah, blah, blah. You're in for a shock. And that comes back to holding those two things. So whichever way you lean, let's let's teach our children to not be shocked when the world is wonderful or when the mm. world is hard. Because guess what? You can't get through life without the world being wonderful and the world. I mean, just look at our world. We've got people that are starving. Children are dying. There's abusive. Ha I mean, there's some gross, ugly stuff out there. And then there's like these amazing views with water and mountains and tropical paradises and kindness that people show each other and miraculous stories of recovery. That is the world. The world is both of those things. And we are doing our kids a disservice if we aren't preparing them that none of that should be surprising to you. That is the world we live in. So how do you hold both of those things and live joyfully within that? Absolutely. This is another perfect example of both and rather than either or parenting. Yes. yes. I love it. All right. We both have quotes today. Yes. We have two <laughs> quotes. Since we came at this from slightly different directions, we decided we'll both share a quote today. And you'll probably hear our just different, slightly different takes coming out in those. So super fun. So Kira, quote us, quote us. Okay. This is a quote by Seneca. True happiness is to enjoy the present without anxious dependence upon the future not to amuse ourselves with either hopes or fears, but to rest satisfied with what we have, which is sufficient for he that is so wants nothing. And I just want to add, while I like that a lot, I think it's okay to want and hope, but not in the absence of noticing what one already has. Yeah. Kira Dorian. Dorian. Exclusion of all else. Okay. Kira Dorian. Kira Dorian. <laughs> We're actually okay with pursuing happiness, but not to the exclusion of all else. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So the quote I have today is by William Soroyan. The greatest happiness you can have is knowing that you do not necessarily require happiness. Hmm. And I do want to add, though, because we, we chose this topic when we did, right? You and I both went, oh, this is the time to do yes. this episode. Because at the time of this recording, because who knows when people are going to listen to this episode, we are in the thick of COVID and the COVID crisis. We're all shut up in our homes. Life is pretty hard right now. And so it, it really is important in the midst of this really challenging time that for those of us that have enough to eat, have shelter, have jobs, have a loving home, this is a really important time to be teaching our kids the tools to living and, you know, let's use the word joyfully. This is it because they are being challenged. We are being challenged to keep that undercurrent, that foundation of joy there. Um, and so you know, it's not to pressure anyone, but more just to say, this is a great opportunity to start flexing those muscles, to pull out a glass jar and help your kids put both puff balls in. So when they're frustrated that they can't go to their you know, favorite activity, put a yellow puff ball in there and then 
see if you can help them find a blue one too, you know? Absolutely. So important. Well, FFPs, thanks for continuing to be with us. It is a little bit of a wild time, but we're so glad that here in the bonus laundry room, we can still bring you content and be just hopefully a familiar voice and a great resource for some parenting strategies when you guys are parenting hard, because this is some serious parenting right now, that is for sure. We want to, of course, remind you, feel free at any time to subscribe to our podcast. We love our subscribers and that way you never miss an episode. So please do subscribe. We're on all major platforms and you can also find us on social media. We're on both Instagram and Facebook. Our handle is at Future Focused Parenting. We love our followers and just appreciate your interaction with us on social media. And as we've said before, you are our best marketing team. So tell your friends if you like what you're hearing on the podcast, please share it. Please feel free to give us a kind review. We pop those up on our social media stories. When we get a kind review, we love sharing those. So please let us know how the podcast is impacting you. And if you have a question, reach out to us. We often do spin cycles on listener questions, and we'll just do a brief episode and address that for you. So if you have a question you'd like us to chat about on raising adults, you can email us info at futurefocusedparenting.com. We look forward to being with you uh, again next week and hope in the meantime, you are happy, contented, joyful, whatever word you like to put in there. And we will see you again soon. Raising Adults is produced by Kira Dorian and Dina Thayer and recorded partially in Kira's laundry room, partially in Dina's bonus room. Music by Seattle band Hannah Lee. Thanks for listening.